Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome. My name is Marisa Goulden, and I have the great pleasure today uh, of introducing our speaker, Professor Jem Bendel, who's going to talk to us about deep adaptation and perhaps other things. Jem Bendel is a Professor of Sustainability Leadership at the University of Cumbria. In, 20, in July 2018, he published a paper entitled Deep Adaptation, a Map for Navigating Climate Tragedy. This paper has since been downloaded from his website more than half a million times and reached audiences far beyond his initial expectations. He's also shared many interviews and talks <coughs> online, some of which you may have watched or heard. And in March this year, Jem launched the, Jeep, the Deep, Deep Adaptation Forum. This is a space to connect people, to foster mutual support and collaboration for the process of facing societal collapse. Until recently, my own work was researching and teaching on adaptation to climate change at the University of East Anglia. And I found this a difficult subject to research, and I really came up against my own numbness and grief. And in response to that, I turned towards uh, Joanna Macy's work that reconnects, some of you may have heard of. I now offer this in workshops. But what caught my attention most about Jem's work is his willingness to deliver an unwelcome message that we face societal collapse due to climate change, and most especially his, will his rare willingness to explore the emotional and spiritual dimensions of this. For himself, and for all of us as human beings. He talks about needing to make space for despair, grief, anxiety, and other emotions that arise. Today at Green Earth Awakening, we have the theme of turning towards. So we're inviting you to turn towards your own experience while listening to this talk, to notice your own responses. At the end of the talk, Diajoti will invite us to take a short pause and connect with ourselves, and then Jem will take a question and answer. To follow the thread of turning towards this afternoon, Sachimuni and I will hold a space for you to gather in small groups to explore your thoughts and feelings specifically in response to this talk today. And we've called that deep listening for deep adaptation. And that's in workshop space two at 2.30 to 3.45. It's just over there. There are also other workshops today that continue this thread of turning towards what is happening in our world. You can attend a grief circle hosted by Extinction Rebellion, also at 2.30. Check the board for the location. And then at 4.15, Claudia will be leading a truth mandala from Joanna Macy's work that reconnects. This is an opportunity to come together to give space to the difficult and painful, and by doing so, open ourselves to more life, joy, love, and compassion. Also in workshop phase three, I think, um, I'll be holding a space for embodying uh, research and to explore the theme today. Okay, so uh, a space to explore embodiment of the themes of today in workshop space three. Thank you. So now let's turn towards why we are here right now in this tent and give a very warm welcome to Professor Jem Mendel.
Is this on? Oh, yes, it is, and you can hear me okay. Good morning. And thank you for that. And it's lovely to hear um, about the way this topic is being held here at Green Earth Awakening. Um, I don't do very many talks on this topic now, and a couple of events in the UK I've been to, one was Sacred Arts Camp, and this is the, the other one I'm at, and it's because both are quite explicit in terms of the spiritual dimension and the open-hearted, loving uh, dimension of, of their gathering. Um, so that's really good to hear you're doing all that holding on this topic after my talk. Um, because it's, it's funny, as I walking around the field this morning, uh, three people said to me, oh, Jam, I'm really looking forward to your talk. <laughs> and uh, I was... Uh, I felt a bit flummoxed, really, because I, n I never want to get numb to this or blasé, and I know I, I really could, because it's a way of coping. Uh, and there has been a time uh, earlier this year when I think I really did get carried away with how much was happening and how many calls on my time and how this was exploding into a, like a, a global social movement, and, and therefore I perhaps wasn't really feeling it. Um, and uh, so I, I don't want to give too many talks and, because, and therefore I want to really sink into the topic and so every time I do a talk like this I check the latest news on, on our climate situation and it, yeah, it, it, it stuns me um, I can't live with that constant attention on climate news I actually deliberately detox from it in order not to be walking around with a tear in my eye all the time. But I did that yesterday and this morning, and, and it's tough. And, um, and I also know that one way of reacting to that, to that shock, uh, fear, anger, is to want to get up and do something. Uh, and I, I have that in me, and I admire that in other people but I also can see how that impulse uh, can also be dangerous to ourselves uh, and, and to others. And so I had the, I've had this dilemma of the balance of the, the inner and the outer work um, ever since the Deep Adaptation paper um, started to become famous. And so I, for me, I had, you know, Extinction Rebellion has been a revelation uh, and I, I spoke at the, um, the, the opening of the International Rebellion in Oxford Circus by the, the Pink Boat of Truth. And uh, there was this, seeing thousands of people there, this sort of sense that I wanted to say, you know, with this, this, this activist energy, that I wanted to say something less bleak. But the first message of Extinction Rebellion and the reason why people have paid attention to my work is this idea of um, allowing yourself to consider what might be true no matter how that might make you feel or how that might challenge your future or how that may disrupt your sense of belonging um, the the concerns you have there so so the way I did it there was to say well we rebel not because we have a, a vision of a fairy tale future where we have fixed climate change, but we rebel because we want to reduce harm, save what we can, and learn from this. So to return to, to truth and love. This isn't an accidental thing that we've trashed the planet and now we threaten our own civilization and indeed our own species this century. And we have to recognize that. So the climate predicament is like this, um, like a severe mirror on our collective consciousness. We have to look into it and see why has this happened? Because otherwise that panicked response could lead to us just doing yet more of those same ways of relating same ways of relating to what's inside us and same ways of relating to each other. We could see blame and hatred 
it's, in, it's natural, isn't it, to, to, when, when you're under threat, to say, well, who's to blame and where should I run and who should I run from and all that sort of stuff. And so we need to support each other to, in, to turn toward this predicament in a way that is more open-minded, open-hearted, to find solidarity in that situation um, rather than withdraw. So um, it's because of that feeling, that perspective, that I'm drawn to be here. Um, less to give a talk, more because I want to be in spaces like this for myself. Because um, they're still quite rare in my life. It's growing, um, definitely, but I still find it's quite rare. But for you to, I think what I should do is just have a little bit of a, a few words on the on the climate predicament, because I, I shouldn't assume that everyone's on the same page. So, um, uh, there's debate about when we should measure climate change from, but if we go for 1750, which is before, human, before the Industrial Revolution, rather than 1850, which is what the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change uses, then the world has already warmed globally by about 1.5 degrees, and that um, that doesn't seem much, does it? And that's always been a communications issue. But that's on a baseline of about 13.5 degrees global ambient temperature in 1750, so that's about 11% more energy in our world atmosphere before humans uh, started burning coal. And that's not... That's not sort of just sort of distributed evenly, the far greater heating at the poles, for example, and so that is already destabilizing our weather systems, as, as everyone now knows. Um, but the problem, of course, is that so much of that, uh, so much of the effect is already locked in over the coming decades, no matter what we do, because 90% of all that additional energy from human uh, activity uh, has been absorbed by the oceans, and so that will warm uh, the air over the coming decades. So there's, there's that already locked in. And then you think, well, why are we seeing uh, Arctic fires now? Um, it's because of changing weather and changing temperatures. Uh, why are we seeing, seeing the, the polar vortex destabilizing and the jet stream destabilizing? It's because of these changes. And the problem is then there are feedbacks. And the, the most shocking feedback is what's happening in the Arctic. Uh, and so some of the most latest research published in a geophysical journal is saying it's quite probable now that there'll be no summer Arctic ice by 2030. Some outlying scientists writing on blogs or giving speeches are saying it could even be in a year or two, but they've been saying that for a year or two, but there's one published study that says by 2030. And one of, well, Britain's preeminent polar scientist, Peter Wadhams, uh, has, with his team, calculated that if all of the Arctic ice were to go, um, then that would uh, warm the planet by uh, half as much as all uh, human-caused or anthropogenic uh, uh, emissions. So you can see we're already, already at 1.5 degrees over 1750, so then 50% more uh, forcing, and that's because of the retreat of the ice means that the sun's rays go into dark ocean rather than being reflected back into space, as well as the loss of the, the ice. You know, it takes up a lot of energy to, to melt ice. So... We're in a terrible situation, and, and Extinction Rebellion has been amazing in helping bring the, 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 that situation to uh, the masses. And also to point now towards what it means, not just for, uh, I shouldn't say just, uh, it means a lot. People are suffering right now across uh, the majority world, Mozambique, Guatemala, and so on. Uh, both by the tragedies of natural disasters, but also droughts and, and, and just general food price rises and, and therefore migration. So this is happening to people right around the world already. And of course, you may have heard the statistic that 200 species are going extinct every day. And again, climate change being one of the key driving forces on that. Um, 
But what's really changed in the last year is this idea that we're in danger. That uh, we saw that weird weather, extreme weather, damaged European food production significantly last year with uh, grains and, and, and vegetables down by around 20% in, uh, in many European countries. Uh, and we've had pretty weird weather this summer as well, and I don't know what the latest data is on that. But um, Britain imports 60% of its food. And unlike places like Spain and, and Netherlands, um, where our, our agri domestic agriculture is very dependent on rain. Um, so we've got some particular risks in the UK, and the British government hasn't done a review of food security for over 10 years. So, um, so that's the, the part of the message from Extinction Rebellion, which is really cutting through, which is, uh, yeah, we, we are now in danger, our way of life. Um, and I think that's, for some people, that's quite a problem, that it seems that we only seem to care when it's like us, rather than the majority of people around the world being badly affected. But uh, I think it's an essential element to our awareness that this is coming home to us now, um, and we don't know how quickly. Uh, I, make a, I make a prediction, in, it's not a prediction, I make a guess, and I say it's a guess in my paper. I predict that societal collapse is likely, actually inevitable, uh, in nearly all societies around the world within 10 years because of extreme weather impacting on agriculture. Now, we could do a lot to slow that down. You know, animals eat twice as much grain as humans on the planet today. So we could actually cope with quite a major collapse in the uh, key breadbaskets of the world. But that would take a massive change in our political system and our economic system to adapt in that way uh, when uh, we have multi-breadbasket failures around the world. Um, so... The problem is also we have such a fragile, fragile system. I mean, I depend on supermarkets for my daily calories, and probably most of you here do too. And that is a fragile global supply system with just-in-time supplies that could break overnight. So we are very vulnerable uh, with our current way of life. Um, and of course, our, even our ability to pay buy something, even made locally, is dependent on a global confidence in a global financial system that props up the banking system which issues our money as debt. And so that could go first. You know, the actual pace of disruption to our way of life from the environment might be something that we may possibly be able to respond to, but our systems that we depend on are so fragile. The financial system, our ability to transact with each other is very fragile, and so that may collapse ahead of any any actual uh, environmentally, um, uh, environmental uh, direct impact on our, on our food supply. Of course, when I talk to people like this, there's the question of who to believe. And I understand that I have the privilege of um, time, but also a training in methodology and going into lots of different academic disciplines, both a natural science one and then sociology, and then taking a very critical stance on on my own profession and the way that we, we, we think. And, you know, but it, that, that's a great privilege that most people don't have. And so I always say to people, you need to make your own mind up. And I invite people not just to agree with me, um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't have agreed with me if I just heard me a few years ago. So, you know, <coughs> I invite people to look at the Deep Adaptation paper, but also that's a year old now, so I've produced a compendium of peer-reviewed uh, research or UN reports over the last 12 months, which I published in, in July. So you can just type in a compendium and my name, and you will be able to download that as well. And that's over 20 peer-reviewed publications, which lend weight to what I'm saying and perhaps even suggest that it's happening even sooner than I, I thought. <coughs> But who to believe? Well, I'll give you a quote from 10 days ago. 
It is abundantly clear that climate disruption is happening now and everywhere. Now, you probably haven't heard that before. It's not being written about in any mainstream publication. The only place I could find it would be a clip on Bloomberg, but for people who are interested in this topic. So that was the UN Secretary General 10 days ago, Antonio Guterres. It is abundantly clear that climate disruption is happening now and everywhere. So uh, also, I, I, I point to that as an indication of our, you know, if our systems of social organization and communication were a bit less stupid, a bit less mad, then that would be sort of in the world's media. Uh, we would be talking about this. Uh, but all kinds of other things uh, take, up our, take up our time, come across our screens and television sets. Now, a lot of people, when they hear this... Um, not a lot. Some people, and maybe not people here, uh, they think that this is counterproductive. To talk like this is defeatist. It invites nihilism. It invites apathy. It may even invite depression. Um, and I realize that when, I'm talk, when I talk to people who say these things, a lot of people say these things in, in articles or in blogs, or in speeches, but when I talk to people, we manage to get somewhere. Because they'll, they'll say, tell me things like, Jim, people need hope. But I'll say, well, can we talk about you? When you, do you think you need hope? Let's talk about that. Okay, so let's explore that. What do you mean by hope? Is it an active or a passive one? Is it this wish for something to be better? Or is this some sense of plan that you're involved in? Let's actually look at that. And secondly, do you need it? I mean, if you didn't have that hope, what would be important to you? And the conversation often then leads to a place of, there are things that I fundamentally believe in, no matter what will happen. And so, also what I'm finding is that people, um, a lot of people are not discovering apathy or nihilism, um, or depression, but absolutely people are experiencing some kind of positive disintegration of existing stories of self and identity. And that's tough. Of course it is, but perhaps it has to be. So it's a question for me of how, how to hold each other in those moments and how for me to invite people to hold me in those moments of positive disintegration, um, where old stories of self and old assumptions about the future disappear, and we try and look for new ways, new ways of finding meaning in this context. Um, and I think that uh, there's amazing power in it. Despair can burn away those old stories and make you an uncompromising, loving rebel. I think that's what we're actually seeing quite a lot of with, with Extinction Rebellion. But I also find that a lot of people don't seem to want to go there unless they have a framework to be held to talk about this. And that's why I came up with the Deep Adaptation Framework. Deep Adaptation is basically saying, um, uh, I mean, my view is inevitable, but you don't have to believe it's inevitable. But it's probable now and actually it's happening already in some places, that societies will collapse because of disruption from climate change. And when I say collapse, I mean an uneven ending of our normal way of life, our normal way, forms of sustenance, shelter, pleasure, and identity and meaning. Our normal forms of security as well. And it, how that will happen don't know. It's, I mean, a lot of people are now asking me to spend time with others to work out how and where. Um, but um, I'm less interested in that, in the kind of stuff I've just talked about already. Um, so the, uh, the deep adaptation framework doesn't provide answers. Um, 
because I think it would be uh, misleading to suggest there are simple answers in this context. Instead, I offered four R's. Um, resilience, restoration, relinquishment, and reconciliation. Uh, and resilience is simply the question of, given this situation, this predicament, what is it that we most value that we want to keep? The second question is res about restoration. Um, what is it that our way of life, our busy civilization, um, what is it that we've lost that we could bring back to help us cope with what's to come? Uh, relinquishment is the question of, well, what is it that we could let go of so that we don't make matters worse by trying to hold on to things that we just can't, we can't and maybe shouldn't keep? And reconciliation wasn't in my original paper. It's the fourth R, and it was because I realized that some people were reacting to this with the narrative of, we must do whatever it takes to try and slow this down or stop this. And that, that, that was coming from a, an energy which I realized was understandable and could be productive, but also could be highly destructive. Um, and so I was inviting people to consider, well, what is it that I need to make peace with and with whom, given that now we realize that our mortality is a much more felt present thing, my own and yours. Um, so that we're not doing all this stuff in the world just to somehow cope with these, these, the unbearability of sitting with this pain and this uncertainty. Um, so that's the idea of reconciliation. And that blog that I wrote about that was very much my, then my connection with the Buddhist community worldwide because Joanna Macy picked it up, shared it with her network, the work that reconnects, and that then really helped uh, connect me with the, the Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist practices and I finally decided that my friend Indapreet was right when 15 years ago he said, Jem, you should do Vipassana. <laughs> <laughs> and then when my partner Katie said for the past year, Jem, you should do Vipassana, and so I finally did and so I am on my own journey uh, uh, in this and so for me, you know, Quid's in, you know, I'm, I'm, it's been really good. <laughs> Civilizational collapse has, a, has an upside for me in my spiritual growth. Um, so yeah, meaning and purpose from this perspective. Um, a lot of people are saying, where's, where's meaning, where's purpose, and therefore where's a vision? So yeah, I, if I'm pushed, I could say I have a vision of a, a livable world. So a livable planet and a more lovable world. But that can all just sound a bit, mm, you know. A vision, perhaps, that's more down to earth would be uh, a vision that's real, which is that we can sit like we are now, and we're in a place like this, and we can hold each other and explore, and, uh, explore what this might mean without wanting to prove, each, uh, prove ourselves right or wanting to qu get a quick answer, that we can be open-hearted and open-minded in working out what to do. And that through that, we will make the best of a bad situation. We will reduce harm. Um, and we will find love and joy in the po process. Um, a more material vision about how society will be or how Britain will be, at the moment, it doesn't really quite feel right for me. Um, but therefore, I think perhaps part of my vision is that we will, more of us will recognize that this wasn't just an accident and will realize that our systems failed us. Our systems of thought, our systems of belief, our systems of economy, our systems of, of relating, they failed us. And this is a massive invitation to rethink everything together. Um, so that's perhaps part of, part of my, my vision. Um, and I also think we are going to do a lot of amazing things. And I'm going to say them out loud, even though it's a bit controversial. I've been talking for about, about what, 25 minutes? I think, okay. Um, I believe we probably will geoengineer the Arctic in ways that are fairly safe through marine cloud brightening. I believe we will transform agriculture as if we were in war and get ready to manage distribution when our grain imports collapse. 
I believe we will create truly alternative exchange systems so that when global financial systems collapse, we can still swap and trade with each other. I believe we will transform banking and stock exchanges in a coordinate, coordinated way so that we don't rely on an ever-expanding economy in order just to have employment and, and have a, a functioning society. I believe we will restore our soils, seagrass, meadows, forests. So we will draw down carbon from the atmosphere in natural ways. We will migrate our nuclear wastes to safer places as sea levels rise. We will organize to ha be able to shut down nuclear power stations safely in states as they fail. We will avoid blaming whoever we're told to blame by the servants of elites or people who have wounds and need to express their anger and have an audience for that. We will host climate refugees. We will provide peer-to-peer -peer psychological support as our old stories of self and place, progress and purpose all crumble. I think this will all happen, but I don't think that will be universal. I don't think that will therefore mean that humanity in Britain or worldwide at scale achieves some sort of maintenance of what we call normal today. And I think it's right to debate all those things, dialogue about all those things I just mentioned, both if they should be done and how. Um, but, uh, but it shouldn't take us away from the the, that, as I said, that severe mirror on why is it on ourselves and our consciousness and why we got into this situation. So I do also believe that this will be a time of spiritual inquiry and evolution. So the question I'm here with, why I've come, is that I know bugger all about that. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, should we, and if so, how do we help people awaken fast? <laughs> and um, how explicit as climate activists should we be about that being our agenda? Um, I'm going to be very interested to hear what you think, both here and in conversation uh, over the next couple of days. Um, just before I close, a few words on, on XR, because I know XR are here, and that's great. Uh, and also Extinction Rebellion is something I'm involved in, and I want to return to that, that initial dilemma I talked about, that inner, inner work versus outer work. Um, and it's this issue, I think, about how do we find some sort of calm, engaged surrender to our predicament. So don't withdraw, but stay engaged but with a passion for all these actions, but an equanimity with what actually comes about in the end. And I think Extinction Rebellion, before the rebellion in October, uh, should adjust its, its three demands. So tell the truth. Well, the truth is people are suffering already. We're in danger. There is trouble ahead no matter what, that our systems have failed us. We must learn as much as we must act. And we must change fairly, which means we must adapt fairly. And that has to be really talked about. So act now. Well, declare a climate emergency, but include fair adaptation to what's coming. It's not truthful to just say, let's do, let's act now to stop this. This stuff is already upon the world. So it's, it's ignoring the suffering that's happening around the world. It's ignoring the food price rises that the poor in Britain are already experiencing and across Europe. And it's ignoring what's coming 
when the current harvest problems feed through into market prices as well. So this is happening now. So Act Now must be about fair adaptation as well as uh, cutting carbon and drawing down carbon. And therefore, beyond politics, well, citizens' assemblies need to look at adaptation. How are we going to adapt fairly to this as much as we can, as best we can? So um, I'm hoping that uh, both at the grassroots of XR, this is how people talk and think, but also um, the, uh, the people at the centre of XR, I wouldn't say at the top, but at the centre of XR also recognise that this is, this is what we should be talking about now. So thanks for listening. Um, we've got quite a bit of time for reflections and questions. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good that you've expressed the necessity to look at ourselves first because obviously if a person doesn't change themselves, they can't change society. It's clear, isn't it? If we carry on being the same internally, this will carry on externally. But it's also the thing of linking the action, like I didn't get your name, but, you know, to move the thing as well because it feels so... One feels so impotent, um, seeing it all going on and not being able to do it. But obviously, it's like a balance, isn't it, between having the yes, and the I, inner work and the outer work. The inner work and outer work. And previously, that often that kind of perspective suggested we sort of just take individual action in terms of maybe not eating yeah. meat and dairy and not not flying abroad, when actually we are political beings as well. So what I like about Extinction Rebellion is it invites us to take personal responsibility in collective action as well as individual changes of consumption and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you